Greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion. As you can tell from the title up there, it's another movie review. And it is another Patreon request from my buddy John. This is his September request. I got his August one at the beginning of the month due to how late in the month I got. Now I'm getting his September one at the end of the month. It, of course, is a film that I don't remember seeing when I was younger, but I knew of it. Because of the fact the trailer for this film, which, as an aside, is not on the DVD was on the VHS, or at least the copy run that I got, of a childhood favorite of mine that I'm probably going to review sometime in November once all the horror stuff is done. That would be Three Ninjas. But the film, of course, is Captain Run! Captain Run! There, here's the DVD I got just for this review. Because I've been meaning to get this film in my collection. Now, just before I get too far into review, just a reminder, if you want to support the channel, you can join the Patreon or do a PayPal donation down below. If you want to just do a one-off, either way, for a request, or to support the channel, do the PayPal route. If you want to continuously support the channel and be able to request videos like this, go to Patreon route. Either way, your support is appreciated. Captain Ron, the second character that Kurt Russell plays that has an eye patch. This movie is directed by Tom, and I'm probably going to butcher this last name, Eberhard, who also directed the 80s cultish classic, Night of the Comet. He's directed some other stuff, but these are the two ones that stand out. He helped write the screenplay along with John Dewyer, which this is the only big thing on John's list, so he didn't really go on to much. Which, from watching the film, I'm like... I don't know why. I mean, he could have at least carved out a good name for himself doing like some of the Disney direct-to-DVD or direct-to-TV stuff that they were doing in the 90s and into the 2000s, but I guess the fact that this film wasn't a major hit is part of the reason why. Because it was made for $24 million, which I could see a good portion of that money in the film. One, for the cast. I mean, you got, in addition to... Kurt Russell, you got Martin Short as the co-star. And then, of course, all the set pieces they have to go through throughout the Caribbean, which it looks like they did shoot on location, and location shooting is usually more expensive. So those two factors, yeah, this film's going to be a little bit more expensive. And it only made about $22 million. And I brought it up multiple times when talking about budget against gross, that you don't just look at the straight numbers when it's Hollywood because... As a certain wrestling promoter would like to say, when you're talking about whether it made money, Hollywood starts to get very kabuki-ish. And by their logic, the film has to make double its budget to break even. I think that's because they always try to make it to where they don't factor in all the promotional costs till after the fact, so that's why they go with that. So the fact it barely made under its budget by $2 million, yeah, it's a flop. No matter how you try to slice it, it's a flop. It's not like Waterworld where I'm like, well, it technically didn't make over it until you factor in that. Either way, it's a flop. But of course, that's the gross when factoring in the theatrical run. Uh, how much it would make on DVD and all that. Which, as I mentioned, the fact that the trailer's not on here just makes this the most bare bones of bare bones DVDs. Because the only thing I mentioned is like the Dolby Sound and widescreen. Which, let's see if it says when this DVD was printed on here. And uh, I'm not really seeing a year on here. Which probably means this is a reprint of its original one. Which, given that, are you really surprised that this film has, has no features? I mean, not even a commentary? This this doesn't strike me as a film Disney's going to spend the extra dough to do something on. Unless it, one day down the road, becomes more of a cult classic. and Or as mentioned, like in a film retrospective that Disney does on Kurt Russell. Because we all remember Kurt Russell started his career with Disney. Uh, what was that? What? I think it was like, wasn't it like Elvis or Walt Disney, one of the last things that they said it was involving Kurt Russell? I think it might have been, I think it was Elvis, because then that ties back into the fact that Kurt Russell did play Elvis in that 70s TV movie. Now, when they wrote the script for this film, they had Chevy Chase in mind to play the lead. And I'm guessing by lead, they mean Martin Short's character, because the original title for the film was Martin Harvey Takes a Cruise. And with a title like that, that definitely sounds like it would be made more for the TV 
Now, of course, Chevy Chase. I could sort of see it a little bit, but maybe they modified it a little bit once they got Short on here. Because a lot of the stuff that Short does, I don't really see a lot of that happening to Chevy Chase. Some of it, yeah. And then, of course, that ran on the at the end. I can see, definitely see Chase doing that. Uh, when uh, I don't know if they ever approached him. IMDb didn't mention it, but other actors that were considered before they cast Short were Billy Crystal, Steve Martin, kind of a little interesting bit there, John Ritter, John Candy, and Richard Dreyfuss. If they got Dreyfuss, that would have been interesting in the early 90s since he also did What About Bob? <laughs> it's like he can't catch a break in the early 90s. John Ritter would have been interesting, I think. Steve Martin, definitely interesting. Would have been there. Billy Crystal, oh yeah. I can see a lot of these ones working off of uh, Kurt Russell pretty well, but having Martin Short in there is good because I'm going to be honest, maybe I have to look into his filmography more, but I can't really think of another film where he's built this up where he's not part of the supporting cast or a villain. Because every film that's popping to mind, he's part of the supporting cast, and funny enough, they're Disney films as well. I mean, the third Santa Claus movie, um, Jungle to Jungle... I don't think the Father of the Bride remakes are Disney ones, though, but those ones, but he's playing a side character in those ones. And those are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. If there's other ones, let me know. Because even with Steve Martin, I haven't looked into his filmography a lot. Now, when they cast Martin Short and then got Kurt Russell, apparently, this is according to John, they were originally cast in the reverse roles. So Kurt was playing the family guy and Martin was playing Captain Ron. And it was only after a night of getting drunk together that they decided to switch. I'm going to say that works to the film's advantage there because I could kind of imagine Kurt Russell playing a family guy. You know, he just toned it down a bit more with the action-y thing. But I cannot see Martin playing this type of character opposite him. Maybe if you add in a little bit more jokes to because he's not the type of character or person you would imagine when you think of Captain Ron. But you, I would feel you need someone a little bit more imposing with a little bit more presence to play Captain Ron if you're having Kurt Russell playing the average family guy. And of course you have to change some of the stuff involving him that you use when you have Short playing him. But it could work in theory. But with those two in the leads, it works better with Short as the family guy and Kurt Russell as Captain Ron. Now the plot of the film is that we have the Harvey family. We got Martin Short as Martin Harvey. Kind of a little funny there. And then we got his wife, Catherine, played by Mary K. Place, who was also in Girl Interrupted in Being John Malkovich. Think we have their children, Benjamin, played by Benjamin Salisbury, who was also in The Nanny. And Caroline, played by Meadow Sisto, who was in the live-action show The Tick. So all the family members did go on to at least have some success. Now, Martin has inherited a boat that was owned by his uncle who just passed away and apparently the boat was at one point it's a yacht more really was owned by none other than Clark Gable and now they're thinking like oh I have a lot of memories of the boat we're going to go down we're going to get it we're going to sail it up to Miami and we're going to sell it now when they get down to where it's docked the boat is not in pristine condition, so they already know they're going to take a little bit of a loss on this, especially since they're selling it up. But it's the experience. But because of the fact it's not in ideal condition, the company they're going to sell it to is not going to give them the best captain. So they decide to go and hire a local, and that turns out to be Captain Ron. And as a quick aside, I'm going to say calling the movie Captain Ron also does work to the film's advantage. And the moment you see Kurt Russell show up, you know automatically what his character is about. He's not the most pristine guy so it fits the boat he's probably a little unsavory probably has a history and some comments we hear throughout the film we definitely see that probably on the run from the law which something at the end of the film does kind of go with that and if he was the one narrating the film he'd be an unreliable narrator but he is likable and that's Kurt Russell's presence there so he's a likable scoundrel type character uh, this is not the same type of comparison so don't think I'm making this a note for note but it's like Han Solo he's a scoundrel but he's likable and everybody likes him to an extent except for Martin Martin instantly takes a dislike to him uh, Benjamin really does like him because he's at that age where he's impressionable and he's like looking at him like a hero Mary Kay likes him at first and even later on after Ron is shown 
his true colors a little bit. She's still trying to defend him a little bit, but Morton's having none of it. Meadow eh, tolerates him at first. Now, as they're going underway, you can definitely tell that Captain Ron is a wing it on a prayer type of a sailor. That he doesn't really know all of his specifics. Like, he's not a good navigator. He knows how to operate the boat. But he's one of those ones that is a stop and ask for directions person if you get lost, which is not the type of voyage that Martin has, so they butt heads a little bit over that. They butt heads over have to have it they decide to run the ship. And then of course a lot of stuff like if you've seen the trailer, the whole Pirates of the Caribbean thing, which ties into a little thing where <laughs> they run into revolutionary gorillas on one of the islands. <laughs> And then uh, for safe passage, they trade guns, and Martin's like, no guns, no guns. And of course, later on, when they do run into actual Cuban pirates, yeah, you can definitely see, oh yeah, probably wasn't a good idea to do that. And all throughout the cruise, Martin is doing his own little captain's log thing, where he's like jotting down his thoughts on the cruise and thoughts on the captain, and how he can't wait to get rid of them. Though, in the end, they do come to an understanding and they have to save the day because they have to get rid of the pirates. And that's all I'm going to say about the ending because I do recommend you watch this film. And I'm going to say this film, it's fun and I'm actually glad I got around to watching it. If I'd seen this as a kid, this would definitely have been a childhood favorite. But, it definitely has some flaws. Like, I'm going to put it here. Eber Hart's direction does hurt the film a little bit because watching the film... And I don't know if it's also because of the director of photography he had. I didn't actually put that in my notes, so let me look it up real quick. And he could, he could frame a shot competently. It's just uh, just something about the way the film is gra graded. It just comes off as a couple steps above a made-for-TV or made-for-Disney Channel 1, which is why I made that comparison about the writer. Okay, the cinematography was Darren Okada. Oh, Phantasm 2, wow. That's probably him working with the director then, because Phantasm 2 is a beautiful film, especially for its budget. Then he went on to do Halloween H2O, uh, Lake Placid, I haven't seen yet. <laughs> Harold and Kumar escape from Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> oh, at least it involves Cuba there. I know that there's movie 43 on there, but hey, that's other stuff. Oh, he was a grip on Phantasm. No wonder he was called in to do the uh, photography in that one, but... My point on that is, there's still something wrong with it. Certain shots do look beautiful. Like that one in, at the end of the trailer where Martin's holding on to the mast. That is a lovely shot. And a lot of the Caribbean shots look good. And then, of course, when the ship's going through the storm, it looks good. But then there are other moments where you look at it. And maybe it's a combination also with some of the costuming and other that, like the gorillas, that it looks... I wouldn't say film school, but like I said before, it's like a couple steps above made for TV. Which, of course, ties into one little bit that I'm so, oh, that would have been interesting. And that was, is that after they hired Kurt Russell on, at one point, John Carpenter was considered to direct. Now, could you imagine that? John Carpenter directing a Disney movie? Well, it's Disney and the fact that it is produced by them, but it was released under their Touchstone Pictures brand, which, probably the smart move because of some of the stuff we have. See, have. I mean, we have Kurt Russell dropping an F-bomb at the end of the film, and probably the most well-placed part you could put it place you could put it in the film, given it's a PG-13. We got a sex scene between the two in the showers. I mean, it's a PG-13 film, so it's as sexy as you can get with that with the camera angles and all that. We do see <laughs> Mary Kay place his butt through the screen on the TV. If this ended up on the Disney... Plus, I have a feeling they'd probably put something over it to block that out. <laughs> but, I mean, definitely earned that PG-13 rating, what I'm saying there. But, you imagine John Carpenter directing a film with this for Disney? It would have been fun. Especially, it would have been another film with him and Kurt Russell. You'd say Kurt Russell only wears the eye patch for John Carpenter. And, Carpenter has even said, if he was asked officially, he would have said yes, because... He would have wanted to do a film for Disney just for the fact it would be an excuse to shoot in the Caribbean. And you know with how John Carpenter set up his shots, regardless of who his director of photography is, you know that the film is going to look beautiful. And then a lot of that other stuff, especially since he's working with a $24 million budget. And Carpenter, 
I would trust with a $24 million budget more than I would trust this Eberhardt person. Because Carpenter, even though most of his films cost probably half that, or at least at this time, like a lot of his 80s ones, him working for $24 million, you know that film is going to look good and that $24 million is going to be spent right. He probably would have come in under budget. But alas, that's a, that's a you know, hypothetical, but would have definitely made the film look a little bit better. Now, there's one other thing I noticed. I didn't put it in my notes here, but... I mean, this is one of the things that I mentioned about Captain Ron being unsavory. He kind of pervs a little bit on uh, Martin's wife. And it's very subtle, but you can kind of tell there are moments where he might be soft-hitting on Caroline. Now, it's not overt, thankfully, but it's very, very subtle. Maybe it's because of how the character's written that it comes across that way. But the only scene where it really is obvious is when he has a video camera and he's zooming in. Thankfully, he zooms in more on Mary Kay. But it's one of those tropes I'm glad they kind of toned down a little bit. Just as an example, if, if you haven't seen it, there's a scene in Poltergeist where the guys who are building the pool are obviously perving on the daughter. And nothing happens to him. That's one of those things If nowadays it'd be like, excuse me, what, what, what are you two doing? Uh, no... Nothing, eh? It looked to me like you were perving on my daughter. What? No, no. Get your things off the site. That type of thing. It's one of those uh, archetypes that back in the day was there. Thankfully, don't really see it as much anymore. Me knocking on wood. Like I said, it's very subtle, but it is there, so I do have to address it before someone addresses it in the comments. doesn't bother me that much because it kind of goes with him being unsavory. And you're wondering, like, what type of past does this Captain Ron have? Especially since he does mention something about statute of limitations. Although I will say, doesn't really negate it a lot, but Caroline is 16, so she's on the higher end of the teen spectrum, but it doesn't fully negate it there. Now, I'm looking through my notes to see what else there is to talk about. This is a fun little thing that most of Captain Ron's wardrobe came from Kurt Russell's closet, so this is his actual clothes. And then also many of his mannerisms, like wearing the Speedo, talking with the raspy voice, were his suggestions, and it definitely helps the character. It's like Ace Ventura with, uh, with Jim Carrey, where adding those things definitely helps the character stand out a bit. Although he did object to the underage drinking thing, but they did manage to persuade him because it fits his character that he is, and it's true. I mean, be a little bit interesting if he drew the line at underage drinking, but having it in there does help a little bit more with this film. It shows how, excuse me, how uncouth he is. Now, the whole thing with the past, this is one thing that I noted at IMDb, but it doesn't go further when it mentions it, is that Captain Ron gives his full name as Ron Rico, which is the name of a brand of rum. Given how he seems to be a type of individual trying to hide his past or kind of keep his past a little down low, that's probably a pseudonym he gave, and Ron could be his real first name, but could not be. Could just be a name he decided to give while he was on that island just to keep it fun. Uh, there's a couple other little bits of IMDb trivia I'm going to go over here. The pirate's boat's name is Obondiga, which those of you who speak Spanish, it's a Meatballs kind of an interesting name for it, but it kind of goes with the whole thing. I mean, I don't have the name written down, but the translation of the island they start on is St. Potato. <laughs> Sounds like a nickname to me. Now, the fir the scene where we see the Wanderer for the first time, it was filmed in Puerto Rico in the town of, and forgive my pronunciation on this, Bahia de Arroyo. And it does look beautiful there. I mean, a lot of the Caribbean stuff looks beautiful. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, those are some of the shots in the film that look the best. And overall, those things about it I've mentioned aside, Captain Ron does get my stamp of approval. John, i got to thank you for having me do this as your Patreon request. And definitely film, and definitely I'm going to watch it a few more times. And maybe not right now after I turn this off, but definitely in the future. If they ever do do a special edition for it, I will get it. Even if it's just like a little retrospective thing, that'd be nice. Uh, I'd like to see if there's anything about Kurt Russell talking about this film. Because it would be nice to get his thoughts on the film. Maybe if I ever do meet him at a con or something, I'll ask him about it. But like I said, definitely worth at least one watch if you're a Kurt Russell fan. 
course, after me mentioning anything with John Carpenter, it'd be like, oh, if only. Till next time, guys.